Welcome to Saturday night. Reloved. And we've got a Chapman ghost fret. Guitar Ryan's ghost fret here. Handsome looking beastie. It's a through neck. Um, what else to say about it? Hard tailed. Twin humbucker. Push pull. Three way switch. Locking tuners. Um, I think we've got a, well, we could, I think it's a tusk nut in there. Now, I'm going to, I've got another one standing by ready, but uh, if we can get this down, if it is tusk and we can get it to the right height, then we can, we can keep with that one. Nice and grubby, the strings are filthy, need a good clean. So, it's in for a setup, and what's true about this straight away is that the action is incredibly high. Well, it's pretty high. Um, so the figures you've got here are, first of all, on the first fret, it's 0.5 millimeters over the first fret, which is high. In fact, it's higher on some than others. So it's, it varies between about 0.5 and actually 0.7. Actually, all the, some of those look almost a millimeter. But anyway, so they're, they're pretty high over the first fret, some of them. Um, uh, no, it's about 0.5 to 0.7. Um, down this end, we've got 2.6 on the base side and 2.5 on the high side, um, which is way too high. We've got 0.6 relief, which is too much. That's quite curved. And, um, yeah, that's, that's the main sort of statistics. So if you look on here, my sort of quick assessment is we can lose at least, well, we can lose 0.2 of a millimeter on the first fret we can lose a lot of relief, so nearly half a millimeter of relief. And that, in terms of relief, that, half, that 0.4 is a lot of relief, so it'll feel very different, different to play. Uh, and then we can lose 1.1 on the low side and 1.3 on the high side. And of course, we'll make the frets underneath that play, which is the point of the Real Love Guitars fret leveling approach. And it's filthy, so it needs a good clean. Um, so, you know, it's uh, it should be touch wood, fingers crossed. It should be a straightforward setup. I'm not expecting any weird surprises, or bad surprises. Um, I make a these are hip shot tuners, so they're nice open, open locking tuners. Um, a nice three part neck all the way through the body, um, through body stringing, little belly cut there, which is quite nice. So yeah, it's a handsome looking guitar. Um, never owned a guitar of this shape, so I've not, I'm not sure what it's like to live with one, but hey. And we've got some Chapman Guitars branded pickups, which again are pretty grubby, so we'll try and clean those up a little bit as well. One of the first things I did on this was to check, I was a bit nervous or a bit concerned that the, um, when you see a, a guitar like this, quite often you look at it and think it's a butte, and, and then you look closer and you think, well, I want to lose quite a lot of height from this action. So the first thing I did was I dropped the, uh, the low E down as far as it would go, and then I came back here and did a measurement of the last fret where I prefer to do the measurement. And that is fractionally higher than I would want to go. So it, it's an example of the, the guitar not being built in, in the factory with scope for the sorts of change or the sorts of improvements that I would typically dial in. We can just about get it here, but beyond that, you know, we're, we're into sort of thinning down this bridge or sinking the bridge a little bit, because of course being a, a fixed a set neck or a through neck construction, there's nothing we can do to raise the neck up. So I just, it bugs me a bit because you, you see a, you know, well-made guitar, Korean made, you know, pricey, you know, not cheap guitar, using a hip shot style bridge, which is quite limited in its backwards and forwards movement. The, the saddles are a bit unnecessarily long in my experience anyway. Um, but, you know, you'd really want this to start from, you know, you want to be able to wind down to maybe a millimeter at the last fret and then go up to two and a half or something like that. You don't want to be bottomed out on the saddles to find you're only barely just getting, starting to get close to 
the target action but still unable to get down because then you look you like i say you're only left with the options of grinding down the bridge which you know taking a taking a half a millimeter off that bridge is quite a it's quite a, a you know a harsh task with you know sandpaper or grinding or whatever you're going to do i mean it's entirely possible because it's a big chunky thick thing but you know it's it's a big pain in the butt deal and of course you know you flake off some of the black finish probably around the bottoms and whatever anyway i'm going to aim for lowering this to exactly its lowest possible setting that it will allow and um what i didn't do while i was at it or well, while i'm at it i will but didn't just drop the uh high e side down because i'm hoping that needs to go even lower but if that only goes to the exact same 1.6 that's not going to be good enough for my liking um well, it wouldn't be ideal anyway um what have we got well thankfully that is slightly different so that comes to one point just about 1.2 um so what i think i'm going to do is i think i will take down all of these uh, saddle saddles down to pretty low now I'm doing this just by eye to begin with guesswork um, and then I will sort of check them by measuring and the aim will be to set sort of a, a target low action and then just double check and what I'm really aiming to do then is to make the frets comply with that nice low action so it's sorry about the position of this oh, that looks a bit too high for my liking mm -hmm. what have we got with with fraction over 1.5 same there that's okay this one's a bit tall okay we want to be on about no i still want to be a bit lower than that Okay, that's good. Turn a bit low on the B. That's about fraction high on the B. Well, we're nearly there. So I think, even though it's not my perfect ideal scenario, in that I would like, ideally, I would like more adjustment room on this bridge. I think given the fact that we're going to make adjustments to um, three things, the first fret action, the relief, and the last fret action, all those three things together will make add up to a pretty substantial improvement. Um, so if it was just one of them, I would be a bit annoyed that I couldn't get right down to where I would want to go on the target action. But because I've got... Um, three different parts of it to play with then it will be a pretty good a big change so I want to flatten this out and I'm going to use the supplied hex key one of just because it's here I had it out at the time now I'm going to I'm going to uh, basically dial out some of the neck relief so the way that works is if you've got too much curvature you put your hex key in the end adjuster which is a little bit difficult to get to with the strings in the way so you may have to move the strings a little bit you put your hex key in the adjuster <laughs> come on man <laughs> difficult to do it if you're not looking at it Wow, that's a, that's a, that is a not very happy fit. Well, it just about fits in, but not a lot of turning room free. Wow, indeed not. You just you know, get it in in the, in the vertical position, which is not fantastic. Right, anyway, so the rule is, if you've got too much curvature and you need to flatten the neck out, you turn clockwise when looking at the end of it. So here we go. Now, of course, as you can see, I now don't have 
much leeway and this thing I'm just going to jam these out of the way because this has got so little access to it the way it's structured in the hole that it's very difficult to get it in and turn it so um, now this is it's a little bit I'm not no it's not I'm not going to blame Ryan for this but these strings are grubby and manhandling them right now is a bit horrible but I need them in there as sacrificial strings so I'm going to have to put up with the crud okay so I've done a, a, a two sort of turns of about that much 45 degrees and maybe a total of 90 degrees so I'm just going to do a quick check and that's reduced it considerably and I'm quite happy with where that is. It will also have reduced the first fret action as well so it's worth just double checking that to see how much if any we do need to adjust on that. Um, I go on the principle that if it isn't broke don't fix it. Um, a little bit higher still but it's not so bad. Um, Hmm, I might be tempted to possibly just about leave it there. The combination of flattening the neck and reducing the action at this end has brought that down to an acceptable level. So I'm going to call that quits for now. Now what I would typically then stop and reflect, so what we say to ourselves in the setup world, we've got a decent first fret action now, which we didn't have before, but thanks to lowering the, the last fret and flattening the neck. We've got very little, about 0.2, very, 0.2 maximum relief in the neck thanks to the adjustment and we've adjusted this down, in fact on the low E to the lowest it will go but it's now set a, a decent action all the way. Those three things together equal the setup as far as I'm concerned and together they make an, an enormous difference on how this guitar will play. Now what I don't know about at this point in time and it's a bit difficult to know and I don't really want to play too much on this because it is so grubby um, is I want to see whether how good the frets are on this as default because a little bit zizzy really string in fact the higher strings are the are the least good <laughs> beautifully out of tune so I just want to get it back into tune for the sake of uh, loading it to the correct amount You can probably see that I've already painted the, um, what do you call them, the frets, <laughs> black, ready for the fret leveling part of it. Might as well sort of get going. Now I'm just going to double check these measurements again because I want to be sure that this is where it should be. That might even be still a fraction too much. What I, what I, an ideal amount is about 1.5, sorry, 0.15 millimeters very very little 0.2 to, or 1.15 and actually this is quite a bit over that still so I could do with another crank on here let's see what it actually is I don't, it might be three or yeah 
Yeah, it's about sort of just uh, it's about 0.35. So realistically, that needs a a little bit more. I'm kind of halving, halving. So I'm just going to go over here and I will get the thing comfortably. I hope into slotted into place. Very difficult to get this to sit where it needs to be. I mean, sometimes people wonder why the uh, adjuster on these guitars can get um, rounded off. It's because of this design. It's just a just a dopey thing to make it so inaccessible. Okay, another 40 degrees, 35 degrees. Now this is pure guesswork or trial and error. So I'm just grabbing it and turning it and then we'll see what it gives us afterwards. Ugh, grime. <laughs> So again, I'm just going to hold down the first and the last for it together. That's nearly flat, and that's pretty close. So I like to challenge it quite a bit if we're going to go for precision fret leveling. This camera's leaning. Okay, so that's my, now with it flattened like that, you can see it's struggling now. So what we just need to make sure, sometimes it, it's different on one side and the other, but actually they're, they're both about the same. It is very flat. It's about 0 0.1 of a mil, which is, well, it's about half what you'd aim for. So it's starting out low, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that to challenge the neck. And so we start with those slightly, um, what it out, what's the word, slightly zinging notes. And the idea will be to free those up now. Um, one of the things I'm kind of reluctant to check, but I suppose I ought to is if the notes are choky, no, we just, we choke out very quickly on bends. So we want to free up that choky noise. And we also want to free up the bends and that's the target. Oh no, it doesn't, I don't know where halfway is on this. It's missing fret markers. <gasps> I'll have to guess. So, so the idea is um, to make a, make um do some leveling and clear up those notes improve those notes and take away the uh the choke and when we bend so that's a good start point can i just drop the string off the edge spread it a little bit and then i'm going to start using the rod and we're just going to literally do it on kind of gravity almost um nothing no hard pressing down or anything and for me partly that's uh, it's kind of a diagnostic run so very very lightly running the beam up and down in what I call the high E track and looking out for where the problems are and so uh, I have to catch the light right and you won't be able to see it but so it's cutting there cutting there cutting there cutting there not much there, not much there, so that's a low spot. Cutting there a bit, cutting there, none there, that's a low fret. Cutting there, a uh, little bit there, not much. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more, 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 none at the end. So that's not too bad. So let's put it back on and just hear if that tiny bit of leveling has improved. I'm just seeing if this is still adjusting because if it's flattening out still, I suspect it is. I'm just going to go back a tiny bit. Um, sometimes the neck sort of takes a few minutes to adjust itself. It's 
You can't always tell. And then you get this thing stuck in there like this. <laughs> Partly because it's under tension from the string. There we go. Again, check the curve. That's a little bit more room. Better. That's not bad. So first little level has improved that, it's cleared up a little bit of choking or buzzing up at the 12th fret. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit more with a tiny bit of pressure, uh, kind of mainly in the centre. And I'm just kind of going from side to side in that track, as I call it, making sure I cover all the frets a little bit. And, and what will happen then is I'll get to see any seriously uh, low frets. Um, okay, okay, cut, 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 still low. So we, we know we've got a dip at this point in the neck, which is very common to have several. This has actually only got a couple. One here, one here on the infinity, and one right at the end. And actually, well, Actually, I'd say that this one's about that big and this one's about that big. So there's two major downs. So we call this level, down, up, down. But it's just, there's no point calling anything level. So we call this up, down, up, down, up, and one down, two at the end, down. So up, down, up, down, up, down. You could draw it. And that's the overall wobbliness of the neck. Now, when you have uh, frets that are slightly uneven and they're choking out when you bend, you won't fix that um, when, when you do the E track, because if you look at it, the choke out happens over here in effectively in the G track. So we won't hear that improvement. So 12th, uh, sorry, 14th fret bend chokes out as we get anywhere into the past the B track into the G track. So we'll, when we get to the G track, we'll hear that clear up and disappear. And that's the, the beauty of it. Oh, we don't need to, to calibrate this time. We'll just do this one straight. <laughs> so now we're going to go into the B track. One of the things about doing this kind of work is, as I've said quite a few times before, is what appear to be the tiniest numerical changes, if you look at the numbers on the board, the tiniest changes make a profoundly big difference. So, you know, if you look at 2, 0.2 of a mil here, 0.1 of a mil there, those three areas together, the first fret change, the relief change, and the last fret change, tiny little measurements, there they are. tiny changes though they are, together they add up to quite a significant uh, feel. You know, and sometimes they can almost be too, too big a change. You know, somebody's just completely taken by surprise and what felt like their guitar um, with so few little changes can suddenly be almost unfamiliar and a, a you know, completely new experience. So well worth remembering that these tiny adjustments make such a big difference. And I, I experience that quite a lot when I make guitars for fun for myself. Um, I can make a guitar still choking out because we haven't got to the G yet. Now we'll recalibrate for the G track. Yeah, so I can make a guitar and quite often I've hated it as soon as I've made it. Um, and uh, you know it's disappointing, and I every, each time I have to re remind myself that um, that it's okay. It's, it's a it's a couple of small, tiny tweaks away from being great. Um, you know, it's it's really. I often forget that, so I get all depressed that it, it's no, it's not how I like it. 
and then I say to myself, just calm down, give it a couple of days, come back to it, redo the leveling, recheck the nut, blah, blah, blah. And I do a few little things, and before long, it becomes my favorite guitar. So it's, it's those tinier changes that, that make it, uh, you know, turn it into a, a favorite guitar. So now we're in the G track, and again, I'm sort of concentrating on just holding the bar mostly in the middle. So I want this curvature of this bar to, to do its work in this track. And if I need to, I will kind of put a bit of pressure on different parts of it later on. Um, and that's quite hard to explain when describing this method because a lot of the time it's good to leave the, the, bar do, uh, the rod doing its leveling and without pressing on one or other of the ends. So, now I know I'm choking there. So the 14th bends up to here. And I just remove that and I can see. Okay, so it's four, let's call it the 14th. What am I talking about? Yeah. Where is it? I'm bending that and it's coming up there. Uh, okay, so it's the 15th fret that it's choking out on. 15th fret on the G. So here's where I tend to now just change the approach a little bit. So I um, spread the strings again. And this time now I'm going to press down a little bit more up here on the 15th fret because I know that there's still a bit of congestion up here. We, you know, there's a, a bit of a low spot, which is what's causing this high E bend to choke out. So I'm just putting a bit more effort down. The, for, judging by the look of these, they're probably stainless steel frets, which means they're taking longer to cut. Nearly. Hear that? We're playing now. Not perfect, but it's got there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back one into the B track, just so this is evened out. I'm going to do a little bit more and press down a little bit more at this end here. Now it's still using the rod across the whole of the distance, but I'm putting a little bit more force into this end because I know that there there's a problem showing up when we're bending notes up here. And, where a lead guitar player wants those notes to play. So, and then I'm gonna open up the G track again. And this time I'm gonna focus a bit more on the top end of the G track as well. Moving from side to side. It's that 15th fret that I really want to ease off. Okay, yeah, it does feel like stainless. It's, it's cutting very slowly, which is okay. Not a bad thing. Now going past there, it's, it's you know, like we're halfway. So I'm going to do a bit more on the G, but keep it pushing towards the D and then um, we'll move on to recalibrate for the D track. Okay, now calibrate for <laughs> calibrate for the D track. go somewhere like that I was, um, I was kind of coming up here in a car and I was thinking what shall I talk about tonight because <laughs> it normally I don't think about it at all I just um, you know talk about whatever comes up but sometimes I get a comment actually it wasn't on a recent video it was a recent comment on a very old video where I was 
sort of chatting on about something or other uh, for what was obviously far too much time for a particular viewer. Um, and it kind of made me think about, you know, I'm not changing the formula of what I do, but nice so right the problem with that is we're over the peak of the hill yeah we can't go past the top of the hill and have it play still okay that's that note there I'm going to do a tiny bit more in there and then I'm going to Call it, call it quitzes. So we're on the G track, and we're at we're at 15. Yeah. So I was thinking about, oh, what, what can I do? Do I think about should I should I be picking a subject and getting into trouble talking about it? <laughs> um, so because sometimes people seem to like something I raise or you know, some and then some maybe sometimes they don't but I'm often you know the, I, I was in the car I was thinking oh, may, am I supposed to be only coming up with things to think about that are to do with guitars because in some ways that's a bit uh, limiting I, I don't think about guitars all the time sorry if that's a some sort of disappointment. I mean, I'm sure none of us think about guitars all the time. Anyway, so I didn't come to a conclusion um, because, as I've talked about before, it's a, a dodgy thing if you're... Well, it's difficult to, it's difficult to speak honestly in social media um, because it's not a nuanced sort of environment you know you, if you express a view you're instantly it's very likely for you to get instantly judged and labeled because nobody can be bothered to take on board any nuance G. So we're talking about 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. G17. I'm just going to focus on G17 a minute. Because that's a problem area. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Yeah, stainless is, it's, um, takes more working because it's much harder. So we get, we get to the middle of the neck and it's just about playing. Oh, well that doesn't help. I need to make an adjustment here. Now I flatten the neck out. This needs a tiny tweak, which probably made the challenge a little bit higher. I think this will this will um, yeah, this will give us our tiny bit of clearance that we need. Oops, drop. Yeah, it's dropped about a quarter of a mil, so that's quite a, just enough to make the difference here. Hmm. 
Put it back in chain. Look at the fingers. Right, let's see that quarter of a mil difference play out now. Great, that's fine. Yep. Okay, last one. <laughs> Low E. I'm going to lower these pickups too because they're now too high. Now the these are sounding pretty good. These low frets. So I don't think we have to do too much here. Just work to the edges and make sure it's all good yeah so the whole thing of oh what shall i talk about um probably in the end it end up, ends up talk about dead strings um and probably ends up making more sense to only talk about what's happened in your day. Um, life stuff. But you know, life stuff for me always involves spending a bit of time checking what's happening in Ukraine. That's point three. Yeah, so that's a fraction more than I'd want. Going to do a See if I can do a 15 degree turn. Right, that's it. So tiny little adjustments. Okay, I'm going to ditch these strings now because they've done their service. No, that belongs to Ryan. That's mine, is this one? Okay, so yeah. So the thing about the setup is if you want to have a low setup, you can, but the lower you go, the closer to the sort of limits you are. And what, that, what I mean by that is, um, the lower you go, the more susceptible you are to slight humidity and temperature change and so on because you're kind of near the tolerances of what's possible. You're very, you know, the whole thing's, you know, it takes the tiniest, because you're so low on the action, it takes only the tiniest little change of the weather, for example, for the, um, the neck to change shape just enough to cancel out that bit of clearance. Uh, and then suddenly what was playing great before is not so good. Now the simple way around that, if you don't want to be skating that close to the limits, um, is to not have that low uh, playing action. And and the places to adjust that or to back off are typically at the bridge end. Um, you know, so go up half a millimeter and you won't notice the humidity changes and so on. Or if it's only a tiny amount, you know, when you find it changes a little tiny bit as winter comes in or whatever, then be prepared to adjust, counter adjust the thing that's actually changed. And of course, the thing that's changed isn't the action at the bridge. The thing that's changing is the curve of the neck as, the, as it dries out or warms up or whatever it does. And so that's why I always say to people, be comfortable and confident in making adjustments to your... Um, to your truss rod because you need to be able to adjust it throughout the year and I know some people kind of think you know well that's for my tech my guitar tech to do but the point is it your your guitar neck will change throughout the year thanks to humidity and temperature and you do want to have a low action most of you um, and so what comes with that is you do need to be able to confidently 
just tweak the neck, uh, the truss rod adjuster too. So if the neck bends a little bit too much and you find that the action suddenly feels higher because it's winter and something's changed that way, you need to be able to tighten up the neck and flatten it out a bit more. If on the other hand you find that the action, um, the neck flattens out all of a sudden come winter and you suddenly start to get buzzing dead frets in the middle, then you need to be confident to slacken it off counterclockwise to allow a tiny bit, tiny bit more relief in the neck. And you need to be able to confidently tweak it, measure it, judge it, and stop or go back to where you want. Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm going to uh, just recrown these frets. So having done a little bit of leveling, I'm going to um, use this concave file to just round off any flat spot on the fret so that it, it gets reshaped into the correct arch shaped thing and actually one of the good things about stainless if I'm right that these are stainless is that because they're slower to work harder struck slower to work it's actually makes it's more confidence inspiring because you you it tends to slow down the the way this these tools work which is bad in some ways because it takes a lot of wear and tear out of the tools but it's good in other ways that it's a nice pace you, you don't feel like you're ever in risk of overdoing anything whether that's the fret leveling or the crowning which is what i'm doing here so once i've once i've um, done this i'm going to start cleaning the whole guitar a little bit um, actually no you know i'm not going to do that what i'm going to do is i'm going to mask off the no i'm going to clean the neck because it can't get the masking tape to stick here if it's covered in dust and grease together finger dna so i will clean the fingerboard more or less then i will tape it up and then i will go into the process of um see this one needs a little bit more work on it because it's it was higher in the middle there yeah then we're going to the sanding and polishing process Oh God, yeah, so so my, the truth about my world is um, just being, you know, watching the time we're in, just quite, a, it's hard to believe in some ways, and then it, and in other ways it's completely logical. But I feel like it's hard to believe that as things are going to absolute hell on this planet, and I'm not religious or anything like that, I don't mean oh, it's the end times, or any of that stuff. I mean, we are we are probably already fatally past the uh, human impact. And I know there'll be people who go, oh, no, 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 it's all man-made, and I, I've read Alex Jones, and I know better. But a, ma a majority of people on the planet share the understanding that human intervention in the environment or human impact on the environment is substantial and sort of fatal to the planet at this point in time. I mean, we're well not fatal to the planet, it's, it's uh, counter to life on the planet. So we're, we're at a pretty dreadful spot right now where, you know, I think a, a report I was reading said that by 2050, 90 percent of plankton will be gone from the ocean, um, from the Atlantic, at least. You know, and anybody who's in science or biology or oceanography or whatever, ocean biology, marine biology is the word I'm looking for, will tell you that if even half of that 90 percent of plankton were to die off, uh, you, the collapse in the food chain in the oceans would be catastrophic and and totally interlinked and so on and so on. So we are in we are in a terrible position. And on top of that we've got this war in Ukraine. And then on top of that we've got China thinking, ah, now is the perfect time to line up to invade Taiwan. You know, we've we've 
killed off any hope of a dem democracy in Hong Kong. And uh, to be fair, the powers that be who handed Hong Kong over to them kind of acquiesced in that to a very large degree. Um, but now it, it's obviously a perfect time to, yeah, to, to, to bring to bring Chinese communism to Taiwan, and it's just it's like oh, you know, do we? And then there's you know rumblings about Japan and the Kuril Islands, and is it Kuril Islands or the Kamchatka? No, Kuril Islands, wasn't it? You know, you just think. What what kind of thinking does that? Where it's we're in a terrible situation, but hey, this now makes it the perfect opportunity to you know cause uh, create another conflict and see what we can get out of that. While everyone's looking away, or while they're blowing each other up over there, we can sneak in and nick Taiwan and reunify. Now I'm taking these. Um, saddles off because it's filthy under there so I'm going to give this a clean up too. It's a little detail but it'll just make the whole thing feel fresher and lovelier. Um, now there's marks in here which kind of show me where these will go back and I've got them in out, out in the right order but the truth is I want to um, re... what's the word? Intonate anyway, or check the intonation. So I'll, I'll put them where they need to be. Whatever happens. So it's a lot of grime to lift out. There's also a lot of grime down the sides of these pickups, and I'll vacuum down there. But I'm not sure how effective that will be. Um, what you can do is lift off this whole bridge altogether. Um, it also, it kind of gives you a chance to have a look under there and see what we would be faced with if we had to remove some material to get a better action. Uh, okay, I've got my power driver over there still charging. But tiny little screws, three very small screws holding this on. Um, then again there's not a lot of force pulling at this because the strings are being held at the back by the th through strings. the metal plate or the metal underside of the um, bridge. So this is quite reasonably easy to clean up but I'll still put the hoover over there. Hoover! <laughs> the vacuum <laughs> just in case. So that's nice and clean there. This isn't so I'll just put this in the grab all of it like so and give it a squidge. This cloth, you can probably guess, is going to go in the bin any minute now. So this has got bits stuck to it. Um, was never a fan of these hip shop bridges. They look pretty good, but the heels are high. Oh no, what song is that? Subs to your tune. Yeah, they, there's a there's something about there's a reason why when you're building a guitar or where you if you're replacing something there's a reason why these turn out to be really inappropriate. But I can't remember exactly what it is. But I have agonised over it in the past. And uh, yeah, like I say, it's just one of those things. You can never remember the explanation. But when you've been in the situation and it hasn't worked out, you fully know why. Come on now, let's get this in here. Mm -hmm. About there, we'll start with that. So put this all back together again. 
and and we'll get on with the fret polishing. So these are quite actually a little bit difficult to line up sometimes. Yes, so I just I don't know, I just I can't quite believe it when you you know you watch the news and the Chinese think it's the perfect time now to warn the Americans that if they get anyway involved with Taiwan. You know, and it's I don't know, it's just it's just amazing to think that there are Well, I suppose it applies to any country, you know, and it would apply including the UK and the US, you know, where any country thinks that it has a right to uh, interfere in the chosen doings of another country. But um, I suppose it's a, it's a sort of if you go back to the idea of a whole world order, you know, if you'd have got everyone in the world to agree that the UN was a, a good idea globally and that everybody will be party to it and that it will apply in all situations, then it would make a lot of sense that you say, well, you may want to, you know, unilaterally interfere in your neighbour's business, but unfortunately it's written here in the world rule book that you can't do that so even if you disagree with us we're going to intervene and stop you and um, unfortunately I, for that to work you have to have a majority consensus and either it's there in the first place and everybody understands that certain things just aren't allowable in international law or they aren't there to begin with but they very quickly become we find those commonalities when, you know, in the face of extraordinarily bad things <laughs> happening. Kind of like the the way that happened at Second World War, and to a degree, I suppose, in the in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where you sort of discover the. The alliance of people after the fact or when it's already happened um, but it's like oh god must you take back a country that has been independent for so long but you now decide must be yours again of course I suppose the Chinese will say it's always been ours and you lot just haven't honoured that fact, I guess as the Russians are sort of saying about Ukraine. It's always been Russian, you just didn't respect it enough. No, I'm going to have to back these off a minute to give me room. I, there was a, an absolutely terrible thing I heard people discussing uh, on the radio and in various forum -y things but uh, apparently there's a video out there of a Russian soldier on camera on video castrating and then murdering a Ukrainian prisoner uh, and it's I absolutely will not go looking for that sort of thing. I, I don't need to be haunted. I, I know I can imagine how terrible that is without, yeah, without burning the image into my mind for perpetuity. But obviously, some people have, and you can tell there's some pretty sickened people who wish they hadn't. Um, I mean, images are bad, but to watch somebody being murdered in real-time video, tortured and murdered. I 
And it, I don't know, it makes me, it makes me think, you know, when, when is it too much? When do you stop observing and, and just say, look, I don't care what it takes, we've got to stop this. And there's a sort of simplistic one-sided, you know, it's, it's easy, over, maybe oversimplistic moral compass thing going on there, you know, you, you look at it and you go, right, that's it, they are wicked, evil, and they must be stopped, and I will take up my cudgel and go off and help. Uh, but of course, it will never, it is never as simple, and it is never just completely one-sided, and yet, and yet, there has to be a point at which the sort of balance of wickedness is, is too much on one side and you have to take some sort of action or else you never do and you you kind of I think it worries me that the idea that we've we so quickly get into this sort of what aboutery thing you know when you go oh look they've done this terrible thing you go, yes but what about the time back in 1756 when you slaughtered the Cook Islanders before they took their revenge on old what's his face Thomas Cook himself whatever, whoever it was, you know, and you, you can keep going back and finding these wickednesses, um, but is it, is it, is there anything good about it if what it does is stop you taking action? Um, I don't know, it's very difficult. You know, there's, there's kind of people talk now about whether um, whether uh, Zelensky will would consider ceding land to the Russians, um, and you sort of look at it and you think to yourself, why? I mean, how could you? How could that be okay to say to somebody, yeah, all right then, look, you know, you you've kind of beaten me up a bit and now because I just don't want to suffer anymore all right you, you, you keep that you know there's your reward for killing my civilians and destroying my towns you, you get to have that I'm, I'm a realist you know um, if you don't if you don't get get it then it's going to be worse so I might as well be realistic and and then you know you think well hold on a minute how can this might be right how can this aggression pay? And then you're into that sort of strangely over-idealistic world of sort of moral absolutes. And you think, am I being naive? And then then you think, am I, have I forgotten real politic or whatever that lovely 60s phrase was? You know, there's idealism and then there's the nitty-gritty real politic, which is the harsh light of cold light of day and what's what reality dictates not what sort of non notional positions hope for uh, anyway who knows i bloody well don't so look here we have a much cleaner creature that's obviously now a bit out of line um now what i'm going to do is i'm going to take some time off camera i think to tape up all of these frets and polish them out and what I'll do is I'll come back to you when that's done to restring stretch out and recheck all of the settings so I'll see you in a little bit okie dokie put that away we didn't need that one so that's been saved for another day saved for another day but had we needed it, it would have been the right size. Pretty good. Narrow. Everything's been out of the packet once here. Everything's been stuck back in. <laughs> okay. So we have, we're back. Everything clean, polished. Everything clean, polished. Um, I'm just, oops, sorry. Are you on? Yes, you're on. Should be to hear me. I'm just going to set up for this end 
and putting re, re what's the word I'm looking for? Restringing. Re but first of all, I'm going to put some oil on here, and uh, then we'll just restring, and that will be a case of tightening up, tuning up, stretching out, intonating. So, just a, a little note here. Um, I guess it applies to everybody, Ryan included. It may be a surprise to you, but um, my years of experience have shown me a couple of interesting kind of universal things. And one of them is that your tuning stability of your guitar has got nothing to do you, with your tuners. Right? <laughs> that's, the, that's the first thing. Um, it has about 50% to do with the quality and the material your nut is made of uh, and the condition of the slots um, and how friction-free they are, which is why I always use Tusk and often an adjustable one um, where possible, not, not in this case, it's not the, that kind of headstock. But um, So 50% is the quality of your nut, and the other 50% is the amount of unreleased slack in your strings. Um, so that those two things together, basically, are what makes your guitar stay in or go out of tune. Um, and so, individually, if your, if your nut is friction has got a lot of friction in it or the slots are the slightest bit tight or the wrong material um, or sticky material then the nut will cause the strings to drag a little bit um, but they will always be kind of catching or or scraping against the nut and, and sometimes if the slots are too narrow the string will end up at different tensions either side of the nut um, as you're tuning it up and then what tends to happen is it will stay you'll tune it up with that tension differential between the front or the yeah, the rear and the front of the nut and then when you touch the string i.e. play a chord or bend a note what happens is that that differential will e either even out balance out in which case the result will be that your guitar goes out of tune or it will go to the opposite way um, and there'll be more tension on another side in which case it will also go out of tune so it's quite um, it's quite important to get this right and the other thing is that the, um, the little bit of um, slack in the strings that you haven't removed um, will stay there for years um, and it will it will kind of eke its way out tiny bit by tiny bit over a number of years so you, you can I've had people bring guitars to me that they strung a couple of years ago and you'd think that they would be you know evened out now and I can grab a huge handful of string pull it and uh, it'll go out of tune and I can stretch it all out so it it doesn't go out of tune anymore but it it wasn't done like that they didn't stretch it out and it still had slack in it. So here's another little tip. Um, if you just lock your string off like that on a locking tuner, you'll get it to hold and you'll tune up and it, it's all kind of quick and wonderful. But if you ever need, for whatever reason, to slack your string off again, you might need to change the saddles or something might break. Um, because you've pulled it right the way through as far as it will go, you're locking your, the point you've crushed with the lock will be in the same place when you try and refit it. There's nowhere else you can go. You can't hold it back a bit because you'll have the broken bit there. So, um, well, you can't because you'll have cut it off anyway. So the point is, you, you I, here's my recommendation. Pull it all the way through first, then pull back about a centimetre and lock it. That's what I suggest. And then you wind it on from there. I can't remember which way around am I going on this. It's bloody hard to figure it out. So what you get is a bit of um, string string wrapped around the, the what's it, um, about a half or two thirds of a wrap. 
but that gives you enough. So if you had to undo that now, you could uh, undo it, do whatever you have to do, take the string off, and then put it back. And this time, you would push it all the way through, pushing out the crimped part safely to the outside um, where you don't mind it breaking or whatever. So it's a handy way of giving yourself one at least one go of slacking off the strings and that's what I'm building into here. Um, so tempting though it is, it's, uh, it's annoying the first time if you have to do it and you, then you find yourself having to find a whole new set of strings because you didn't build in this little tiny extra bit of get out of jail you wish you had and then you'll take my advice from, from ever onwards. There you go. Um, the only reason anyway that you want less material around the post is to help reduce the amount of slack that you're storing in your whole string train. And yes, it's a nice idea to have none, no string at all because it does minimize the amount. I would rather stretch out a little bit more over a space for a couple of minutes and still give myself that get out of jail, one release, one retighten freedom um, that I wouldn't otherwise have. So there's my little <laughs> hard won tip, you know, and I, I've learned that from having to waste sets of strings on guitars with locking tuners when I'm setting them up and then finding, oh no, I've had to, I don't know, for example, slack it off to change um, change, I don't know, the saddles round on a, on a tunematic bridge, something like that. So, come on, three, you go. Uh, yeah, so, all good things learned the hard way. Also, if you do put an extra bit of wrap around it, you, you'll find that you don't have to crush the string as much as you do when you only go through the first time, because you've got a bit of extra grip. Um, one of the problems with locking tuners is that you never actually know how hard you need to crush the string and often we crush it more than we need but we don't know because the last thing we can afford is the string to come out. So we tend to over crush which tends to weaken the string obviously. Uh, meaning that we break them certainly if we slack them off. So, so there we have it. Let's zoom out. That's that strings on. Now I'm going to give them uh, a little bit of pull. So I'm bedding them in a little bit. And then we'll just be into a bit of stretching. These are 10 gauge. So then I tune them up, which is always a bit odd on these back to front headstock. So then, get hold of the strings and push and pull between thumb and forefinger, as well as these long bits down here behind, especially on this kind of reverse headstock, you've got quite a lot of string behind the nut, so give that a good stretch too. So I'm pushing and thumb and finger pushing and getting these things really bedded in. The thing about putting a lot of strain into the thumb and forefinger is it's sort of soft points of pressure on the string so it's not likely to snap them unless you push too hard. Somebody asked me the question the other day about did I ever use the plastic string stretchers and I've got one in the well, in the storeroom somewhere there but I, I ran it for a couple of weeks and although it saved the sort of pressure on my fingers uh, it had no tactile feedback from it and so I'd ended up breaking more strings. So you hear how much it goes out of tune there.
So, same again, stretch it out again. <laughs> and like I say, if you do this thoroughly now, and it might take 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, if you do it basically until it stops detuning, then you will have a guitar, along with your tusk nut, um, you'll have a guitar that will stay in tune when you, <laughs> when you pick it up and play it. And that, if you haven't had one before, you won't even know how good it is until you get get one that stays like that. And if you've got a series of guitars, you, chances are you may have one that is like that, just almost by chance, um, for reasons you might not know why, but it's for a combination of these reasons. Um, and it'll be the one you keep getting off the wall every time. more of a grab and stretch. Always be a bit careful at the higher strings because they are more likely to break than the others, obviously. Pretty much good. Now the last part of the operation is to check the intonation and adjust it. And we go in with the. Uh, is this loose? Bugger! It is. Oh, always the way, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Methinks me we're nearly done. Only to discover. That the jack socket is loose. No, come on, you. Sorry, terrible view, lack of view for a minute. I'm just going to get this undone and tighten it up, and make sure it's good before shutting it back down. <laughs> it's got good quality strap buttons on. These are the um, uh, shallow locking tuner types. Locking tune, locking strap buttons type of things. I don't often use the locking part but I do like the big strong things <laughs> that come with them. Right, I, it's difficult, you aren't going to be able to see this. So, what I'm going to do it is slightly out of view. Sorry, you um, hard to actually film this and so I'm going to hold this here and do this loose jack anyway. Um, take that off, push that back. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little bit of low strength uh, locking thread lock on it just to hold this. And stopping it do that annoying undo itself thing. So then we that on like so, and then them on like so. Now, difficulty is at this angle, it's getting this nut on. Hmm, <laughs> definitely a difficulty. Come on, ah, bugger. 
Just hard, there's no extra room to pull this out. Um, so I'm having to work with this sort of tied in place. So I'm just trying to trying to get it to bite the nut, but it is really got it. There is no leeway at all. Thank you. I'll be really sort of patient with these things. What I'm also going to do now is get me a piece of cloth to hold this to keep it from moving while I tighten this up. It might be that this fits the size of this, but I'm never quite sure whether it's the right sized one or not. Shall we see? No, it's the wrong size one. Why don't they make those the same size as the tuna ones? Eh? So just a really case of brute force, some careful holding. Careful holding. And we're back to do this up. So that won't come undone again. So there we have it. That's that sorted out. And the final thing is the intonation, which we'll test in a second. And then it's home time of a Saturday evening. Tomorrow in the workshop, I have got... What have I got tomorrow? I have got... Tomorrow in the workshop, I have got a freshman acoustic guitar for a setup, which might be having some fret leveling. Right, so back to here, we plug in, nice. Um, we sort of look down there, what can we see? Uh, sort of, plug in, uh, right, well we'll sort of do this stood up the proper way. Can you see what's going on there? Volume up. Fraction high, so it's a tiny bit short. So what I'll do is I will bring this back a little bit and I will bring everything else back in keeping with it. So I've done it all relative anyway. Um, and each one goes back about a millimeter from the next. And usually is about right. Pretty, pretty consistent. So that's looking a bit long. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push both of these forward a little bit and come back forward on that one and a bit forward on the E as well.
perfect. That's done. Happy with that. Thank you for sticking with me on this Saturday evening. One last polish and I am off. Oh, no, <laughs> one more thing to do. Just double check. Right, so this is this is quite close to the pickups down here. So we need to try and lower them a bit. I don't really know how much room there is on this. There tends to be sometimes quite a limit on how far you can go down on a body mounted uh, pickup. That's about right, actually. Okay, we're good. Check that, check that, check that, check that. Double check the action. Where's my thing gone? Just a final, I had said goodbye, but uh, last couple of checks. Now we're all there. We are actually quite cool. That's quite nice and low. I want one and a half, please. That'll do me. Uh -huh. All right. That's a little high, isn't it? A little high. You can do these by eye often. Beautiful. Perfectly intonated as well. Happy with that. What a lovely outcome. Thanks for watching. See you again soon.